You're listening to PJ and Friends on PJandFriends.com. Orlando, Florida. PJ and Friends is proud to present another edition of their Spotlight Interview Series. And now, welcome your host, PJ. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you're on the air with PJ and Friends, another I- edition of our Spotlight Interview Series. Today, we have Mr. John Hunter on the line. Hi, John. How are you? Good. Good. How are you doing today? I'm very good. Now, I, I, I kind of feel guilty a little bit because I know sax hours don't start until 11, and I just, so I don't know if I've gotten you up earlier or, or you know, like, you this know. Is, this is very early for me. <laughs> we, yeah, the office opens at 11. I don't roll in until 2 o'clock. <laughs> It's Baker's okay. hours. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, and I don't know how late you're there. I know with some of the classes and stuff, you can you can be there pretty late. Um, um, so the, the whole point of this is to get to know you and to find out about you and, and learn about uh, what is John Hunter. So where's your wife? Let's talk to her. No. Um, um, okay. So where were you born and raised? Um, I was born actually. I was born uh, in uh, an army base in Columbus, Georgia, uh, but I was raised in Tampa, Florida. We moved there when I was about four years old. And, uh, yeah, I lived there until 1989, and, and uh, that's when I moved to Orlando for the first time. For the first time. You've been mm-hmm. here a lot then. You, you leave us, and you come back, and you leave us, and you come back. That's okay. Um, so, um, um, okay, w- w- so you, you went to school here in Orlando then? Um, I, well, I went to high school in Tampa, uh, and uh, then I, I started my uh, whirlwind college tour uh, at the University of South Florida in Tampa, and then I transferred up to the University of Florida uh, for a couple of years, and then uh, the university suggested I might be better off pursuing my education somewhere else. Uh, I, w- I wasn't making sufficient uh, um, progress towards a, an academic degree, along with other, <laughs> with other disciplinary issues. Uh, so that's when I, I dropped out of college and um, uh, dug ditches and poured cement and washed dishes and said, man, I don't know if I want to do this <laughs> my whole life. Uh, and as it happened, uh, through a, a series of um, fortuitous events, uh, I got hooked up with an entertainment company there in Tampa. And uh, that, that's when I began to think, hey, I'd, I'd like to make a living in entertainment. And uh, so the last almost 30 years has been uh, a continuous process of figuring out how to, how to make that work. And... Uh- and what year is this? What year are we talking? About? Is this happening? I moved. Uh, I moved to Orlando. I got the job in Tampa in '87, and I worked for a couple of years with, with the entertainment company uh, as a, a clown, singing telegrams, uh, inter- interactive characters, which was still a kind of a novel idea back then. And then in 1989, I, I moved to Orlando and got a job uh, at the Magic Kingdom. Yeah, and. Uh, um... Okay, and well, I remember. I know that you were associated with uh, Universal for a while. You, you you were friends with Doc Brown, and you did a, a couple of things there. Uh, I did not know that you had been associated with Disney, but I guess at one point in time, it seems like everybody has been. Um, yeah. Um. So, okay, you moved here in '89. Uh, at what point did you? Uh, when did? Were you always interested in improv? Was, was the entertainment you're doing? I guess the clowning and all that stuff is is. Uh, improv in nature, so I guess it's always been some sort of improv, right? Well, it, it, performance. I mean, uh, yeah, I was always interested in the show. You know, growing up as a kid, um, I wasn't the I wasn't the class clown, but uh, I, I would watch the class clown and think, you know, I, c- I could write better material for him than that. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, you know, but, but growing up, you know, I, I, I liked comedies. I mean, I, you know, uh, I liked stand-up comedians. I had a, a vague awareness uh, of a company called Second City. Uh, I remember in the mid-'80s uh, on Showtime, they had a big Second City reunion show. And you see a lot of people on that, and you're like, oh, that, that person did this movie or this TV show. I didn't know it started at this theater company in Chicago. Um, but that was, that was about it as far as improv. And so when I was uh, actually... My first year at Disney, uh, I was getting ready to go do a, a little show they did at the castle. I was in the character department. And uh, the guy next to me who was dressed as, Ge- as Geppetto turns to me and he says, you know, hey, Geppetto's Italian, right? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, Italians are emotional. And I said, well, sure, I guess. And so then he proceeded to do a, a heartbreaking, hilarious soliloquy uh, to Pinocchio, his, his lost son, to please come home. You know? And I thought, this guy is really funny. Um, and his name was Wayne Brady, and he said, <laughs> you know, hey, 
I, I do this thing with a, a group of people downtown. It's called Sack Theater. And I thought, Sack Theater? I don't, okay. <laughs> and he said, you should, you should come see this uh, and check it out. And so I did. Uh, and I thought, well, this is, this is interesting. These people just, you know, they just get up there and go crazy, and it's great. Um, and, you know, throughout the years, you begin to realize it's not, not just people getting up and going crazy. Uh, but that's how I got involved with the Sack Theater. Um, they would give, you know, impromptu workshops uh, on Mondays and people could just drop in and that kind of became a formalized set of classes and from from then on in I was I was pretty much hooked. And um well that's cool. So so okay, when do do we know when the original first uh uh Sakami lab series of classes were taught? Yeah, it was um it was in 92. It started in 90, yeah, like the, right around the fall of 92. No. Uh, they organized a set of classes. There was a performer there named Aaron Schur, who was a very, very funny performer. He was kind of one of the first of the, the SAC troupe to move out to L.A. He became a writer and then a, a producer on uh, Everybody Loves Raymond and then The Office. Uh, he was our first teacher. He was very, uh, very analytical, you know, very um, insightful. There was a group of about eight of us. It was an eight-week class. And we just kind of went over the real basic rudiments of, of getting up and interacting with someone and creating something. And then when they finished, uh, uh, they said, well, we said, well, great, what, what do we do next? And they said, we don't really have another class. <laughs> do you, you just want to do it again? So we said, sure. Uh, and we did it again. And halfway through the second run, uh, this is early 93, um, uh, one of the performers named Matt Young said, hey, we're going to we're going to start a rookie night. Would you guys be interested? And we said, yeah, yeah, of course. And that, and that became um, a show called The Next Generation. And, well, that, that's very cool. So, so, um, so were you guys, was your class, was your series the first? Uh, well, I, so Lab Rats is one re, once removed from Next Gen then. Or, or um, 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 is there, a, again, not trying to, is there a skill set difference between, obviously there is, between the Lab Rats? So are, I guess what I'm getting to, are you, well, you guys were the very first uh, people that graduated from anything uh, SAC University related and then became a performer. Yeah, yeah, they, they um, we, we were sort of the first set of classes, and when they started the Next Generation show, they, they asked the people in the class, hey, do you want to be in the show? There was about seven or eight of us, and they also invited um, you know, uh, about 10 to 12 other performers from around town, you know, just from the theme parks and, and from the shows uh, that, that, you know, the, uh, the, the cast of the theater knew. It just an interesting mix of performers and very, very wildly different uh, levels of experience of, of improv. So those first couple of months of the Next Generation shows were like the Wild West. It was just, it was just any, anywhere from 8 to 16 people on stage just screaming and climbing all over each other and hanging from the rafters. Uh, you know, and so, some, occasionally some, some good improv would break out, but it was always entertaining. Uh, and, that, and that cast kind of boiled down to a hardcore uh, 8 or 10 or 12 that we began to kind of uh, coalesce around a, a more unified uh, version of, of improv. And, of course, they, they told us, you know, this is great. You know, it's a Tuesday night. It's a Wednesday night. Have fun. You know, we, we're set for the weekend. We don't really need any, any more players. But inevitably, players begin to migrate up uh, to the weekend. And then when the sort of the founding cast of Sac Theater um, uh, formed a troupe called House Full of Honkies and, and uh, moved out to, to Los Angeles, um, uh, some of us kind of came up to fill the void. You know, I remember when you and Dave came over to uh, WELE when I was on, on the air over there, and I had done a little research, and there was actually a website still for House Full of Honkies. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and, you know, Dave was, so were you one of those guys that went or no? No, I was, I was the group that stayed, stayed behind. And, um, we, we called ourselves the second cast of Saturday Night Live. Uh, <laughs> Those guys had built, you know, such a, a following and, and such a devoted following. Cause they, it was just, you know, they were amazing. Um, uh, just the cohesiveness and, and the speed and the uh, the sharpness uh, which they had. Um, and so uh, there, there was a group of us uh, and some some other performers that had come in. Uh, just great great performers uh, that you know said, "All right, we'll we'll carry on here, here at SAC." And um, 
And of course, some of the original founding members of SAC were still there, so we weren't completely <laughs> in the wilderness. Um, but uh, it, it was very gratifying to, to kind of be able to sustain what they had started and even, even kind of build on it. And then, of course, in, in 1998, I decided to, to hell out, head out to L.A. myself uh, to seek fame and fortune. Right, and I, I remember uh, you told me that once. Um, you went out there, and, and am I, do I remember quickly that you wrote some scripts or you wrote some things that, that uh, you were trying to promote out there? Well, uh, I had a, a writing partner. It's a fellow I'd worked with at Disney uh, named Chuck Snyder, um, and he and he, and also, he also performed at SAC. We were in the Next Generation show together, and we, we kind of moved up to the weekends around the same time. Um, and we'd gone to a seminar in uh, Los Angeles called Comedy Writing, the, the Art of Comedy Writing. And we talked to a number of people at the seminar. It was a great seminar. Um, and, and the people that really caught our attention and we enjoyed talking to were people that wrote for half-hour television comedies. Excuse me. I'm drinking a lot of caffeine to try to stay awake here. So. Uh, I'm with you. Uh, and so we said, you know, I bet we could do this. And at that point, our first teacher, Aaron Schur, had, had gotten on a show, a half-hour comedy called George and Leo. It started Bob Newhart. It only ran for about a season. Uh, but he, so we made a call to him, and he kind of gave us the, the lowdown on uh, how, how it worked out there. And so um, we, we said, well, let's, hey, let's, let's give this a try. So um, I, I was married at the time, and, and my wife said okay, and Chuck's wife said okay. So we moved out in 98 and um, wrote a couple of sample scripts. Um, we got an agent. Uh, and then we we went to work on a couple of shows that um, that no one has ever heard of. <laughs> they have disappeared into television history. Uh, but every now and then, I still get a residual check, you know, from from Spain or something for for fifteen dollars uh, for the Showtime show. Uh, but yeah, we uh, we were writers, and and the improv background was enormously enormously helpful, uh, just in terms of uh, kind of navigating the writers' room. Uh, picking up on the energy of the room, creating uh, with a group and as a group, um, and plus there was just a lot of really cool improv out in LA, and uh, and there was sort of a, a migration of Orlando people uh, over. I was out there for just about six years, uh, just a steady migration of people from Orlando, people from SAC. Uh, so there was kind of a we called it kind of the West Coast version of SAC. You know that I, I I love this part of what you I love the history of, of uh, and I want to say sack related but uh, I I guess I just equate that because that's where I know you from but um um you know the dreams and hopes of of because we I know you always at SAC. I always I know you from you know you're you, you know you've always been a, a kind of a pillar there you know you've been a, a solid member and and uh, I've seen you perform many many times and and so it, it it's uh, easy to forget that you guys started out with hopes and dreams and other things as well and you might have had trials and errors and failures and successes and and so forth and I think people you know they don't realize that you guys have gone through a lot of stuff to get to where you are and you still may not be where you wanted to be but it's still a nice place to be. Um, yeah. So it's, it's kind of cool to, to hear this stuff. Now, um, you, so, so uh, the stuff, okay, so for whatever reason, it didn't take off the way you thought it would, and you came back to Orlando. Um, and um, um, what, what happens next to, to John Hunter? Uh, well, uh, I moved back in, in 2004. I was divorced. I was broke. Um, I was ready, <laughs> ready, ready for something new. Uh, and the thing I always appreciate, appreciated about Orlando is that, uh, you know, you, you can sort of make things happen for yourself here um, at, in Los Angeles. And I, I'm, I imagine very similar in, in Chicago or New York. Uh, there, there's only a certain amount you can do to, to, to get yourself going. A lot of it, uh, if you want to work seriously in the entertainment business, is in, is in the hands of other people. You know, pe waiting for people to make a decision to possibly consider maybe looking at something perhaps maybe that you had produced and possibly talking to someone else about maybe, you know, uh, uh, taking another look at it. And it it's, a, it's a long process and there's not a lot of autonomy until you get to a certain level. So Orlando, there, there was certainly more opportunity just to sort of wrap your arms around, uh, you know, your career, as it were, and, and take it in a direction that you wanted to go. So... Uh, when I came back, I, I was just, you know, it was great. I, I'd, uh, yeah, I'd had a lot of the pride knocked out of me, but I had a lot more self-confidence, ironically. So I was ready for anything. Um, 
and uh, one of the one of the mainstays of SAC, Lyle Moon, yes, uh, yes. the director at Universal, and he said, "Hey, you should come. Just just come on out and, and audition." So I did, um, and that was that was great because I got a, got a couple of things out there that that sustained me um, while I was getting reintroduced to SAC, which was still around, had moved locations, but was still around. Uh, and uh, I was able to kind of uh, hop back in and start performing and teaching there. And uh, the, the, the great thing about theme park jobs, and I know they can, they can be difficult in a lot of ways, but uh, theme park entertainment, is it's, it teaches you about the show. Um, you know, I've, I've come to improv from a performer's background, which might be a little different than a lot of people come to it, uh, if they're taking a class and they they watch shows and and they, uh, they 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 come kind of from a purely improv perspective and I sort of went the other way I was a, a performer for a while a good while before I began exploring improv so the the show has always been kind of a focal point of hey if if someone's watching me do this um, and especially if they're paying to watch me do this uh, there's you know there's a technique I want to be respectful of and mindful of there is uh, you know I'm asking for their time and attention uh, and so you know uh, my mindfulness is is key and which seems almost antithetical to creativity sometimes which is well we're just you know we're making this up together so we just got to let it rip there's a lot of factors that are weighing into it uh, and, and and theme park work is just a great way to, to kind of build that muscle of hey you know you're you're where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there uh, ready to, to do the best you can. And then you kind of merge that with, all right, I'm in a completely loose and open state, and, and I'm going to connect to my partner. We're going to create something amazing. Uh, so I, I think, you know, performance improv brings out the best of both of those. Uh, and, and that's something that uh, we, we talk a little bit about in our classes, uh, especially as people express more of an interest in, you know, hey, how, how can I... How can I do this uh, outside of a classroom setting? Wow, I see. I and, and okay. Um, I, know I talked for a long time there. <laughs> no, no, no. And this is what this is about. Uh, here's the thing. Here's what I've what I've discovered, and and I um, kick myself a little bit um, because of this. You, um, I have found that um, a lot of the 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 very talented and skilled performers, uh, at least ones I'm finding at SAC, and that are are, are finding. You know, progressing where I would wish I could progress at SAC, or even anywhere else for that matter. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, those that are really well educated seem to do better. And I say that meaning um, I watch, for example, Nicholas Ware, who's uh, uh, very. I think his I think his deal is philosophy and all that. And and but he's just very smart and very witty. I look at um, you probably. I don't know if you know who he is, but uh, uh, Nicholas Riggs over in uh, a post dinner conversation in Tampa. Um, he. Uh, teaches uh, improv at U USF and and um, but he's got uh, I've watched him and I've taken the workshops with him and just just his grasp of the who's and how's um, uh, are you still there looks like we lost him so he's gonna call back in a second and then um, he's gonna call back in one second we are, we're having an internet connection on his side so he's gonna call back on a landline so that's what we're gonna do uh, we'll wait so how's your day? Tell you what, um, you know, wait, let's just do a quick commercial. How about that? <laughs> um, it's going to throw him, but. Um... PJ and Friends have several ways to promote your product, service, club, group, or business. Uh, you can sponsor a segment or a whole show. Advertise packages are affordable. And can, uh, we can barter in exchange for goods and services. We can get you heard. We have live reads, 30 and 60 second commercials. We can do shows live on location. Uh, visit pjandfriends.com and uh, check out our website. Check out what's going on there. Check out previous shows. You can call us at 407-706-9497. 407-706-9497. Uh, or you can email us at sales at pjandfriends.com. And uh, one moment, please. You're listening to PJ and Friends on pjandfriends.com. Orlando, Florida. 
Have you ever wanted to ride in a hot air balloon? Well, you can with Orlando Balloon Rides. It's an adventure of a lifetime. Take a ride in a hot air balloon. You will fly with the winds on a truly amazing journey. Explore Florida from the orange groves to the theme parks and more. See it all from a whole new vantage point. Experience total excitement from start to finish. You will ascend above the treetops to several thousand feet. This is an experience of a lifetime. Visit OrlandoBloonRides.com for more information. That's OrlandoBloonRides.com. Hey, John, welcome back. Yep, okay. <laughs> Technology. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We have commercials, so we can do that. Um, oh. Well, let me see here. Uh, all right. Uh, so what I was at, what I was t- getting to, before I don't know how far we got, but uh, uh, what I was talking to you about was well, I'm finding that people with different levels of education um, seem to do well. They seem to be wittier. They seem to be smarter. They seem that even if it's something not associated with theater or acting or improv. And I, I, I was mentioning earlier that, like for example, Nicholas Ware. I think his background is philosophy. Uh, Nicholas Riggs over in uh, Tampa. Uh, he has like you know, he's sort of been on a mission. He's very young. I think he's in his twenties. And um, uh, but he's gone to Chicago and he's gone to all these different places, uh, Austin, Texas, and he went out to California, I think, and New York, and and so he's seen improv and workshop with so many different people. But he's um, also a, a pro- not a professor. Uh, I, I don't know what the, the word is. They, they've used the word adjunct. I don't know what that means. But um, <laughs> there you go. For those of you that are smarter than me, you look that up. Um, they uh, uh, anyway. So he teaches over at USF. And what I'm finding is that people that have um, for example, in Lab Rats, okay, we have quite a few people that that that, that are uh, computer programmers. They write code, you know. And I'm looking at these people, and they're witty, they're smart, they're quick, they're. And um, I think one of the things that I was taught, um, especially in, in uh, some one of the incarnations of the workshops at Sac Hymer Lab, was that you can bring any of your skill sets with you, and any of the things that you do in life. So if you sing, you can sing. If you can dance, you can dance. Any of those things can enhance things you do on stage. And so as you speak, and even as I take classes with you and workshops with you and all that stuff, um, it, I wish to God I could ha- record it and just put a tape in my head and remember this stuff because <laughs> it's all very valid. And I listen to what you say. And, um, um, you know, Richard Paul's like that. He's just, he's just, he's, you know, um, it's kind of crazy. If you go there, if you go to a workshop and you simply want to have fun, which, which the learning is fun, but if you want to get on stage and play, um, but he, ta- each of you can take you you can take uh, dissect something that we did down to the core, and that's cool, very 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 cool. Um, I just wish I could hold on to all that information. But anyway, what I, my point was is um, um, you're very intelligent, you're very smart, and you 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 share your you share your <laughs> open to debate. <laughs> well, well um, thank you. Well, the person I know, and I I I you know. When I sit there at SAC and I and we'll we'll have done a scene in, in Lab Rats and and you'll pull it apart and you'll tell us why and you'll give us options and you're saying you could, and sometimes it comes across as wow did we do the scene wrong should we have done that because that's what he said we should have and we wait a minute and and then there are times in the workshop you'll stop us and you'll say Tr- say this and we're wait wait a minute but I understand why you're doing it and. Uh, it's just so cool, and and I wish I could, you know, um, uh, you, you're so smart, and 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 I, I you know, it's kind of like I, I can only hold so I, I I wish I could take it all that you give me. I wish I could get it all because, um, <laughs> anyway, there you go. Yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. It, it it's all well, it's all processing information, and I mean, and that's that's the beauty of 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 creative, spontaneous, you know, creativity, is that it's so so subjective. As I, I've I'm constantly talking with people and reminding them that that you know I, uh, this this is a phone interview, so you know I can't do the visual, but I you know I like to hold my arms far apart and say this is this is creative endeavor, you know, and then I put my arm you know, my hands closer together and I say this is performance art, and then I put my hands closer together and say this is you know performance comedy and then i bring my hands closer together and say this is improv comedy and then i bring them you know i hold my fingers apart and say this is short form and then i squeeze them almost all the way together and i say and this this is that comedy lab you know so you know what what you know what we're doing here is just a particular uh perspective on hey let's spontaneously create together here's some observations that that as a theater we've all kind of agreed that can be helpful you know uh, I hope it's helpful for you. And then kind of just accepting that and then realizing there's, there's a huge, you know, uh, world out there of, of possibility. And so 
ultimately n- nothing is is right or wrong or good or bad you know short of intentionally harming your partner uh, while you're creating but but it's easy to kind of get wrapped up in well this is this is the only way this is the way this is the true way and of course that that's you know that's not accurate of of, of any particular style or philosophy um you know uh and so just processing information, you know, wherever you're at, saying, okay, this is this is sort of the uh, the perspective that this, this group, this entity I'm working with is taking. Let me, you know, let let me process whatever information I can. Uh, let let me, you know, uh, whatever I hold on to is useful to me. I, I found that invariably for performers, you know, uh, when they say, oh yeah, that's right, that's right. I always want to do this, but I forget. Like if, if you keep forgetting, then it's it's probably not going to be of a lot of use to you, you know, because if it's, if it's helpful and you do it, you, you remember it. You, you're just not even conscious. You just remember it and, and you'll, you'll keep utilizing that tool. And if, if you're finding it's not helpful, um, generally you'll, you'll, you'll forget it, but then you'll figure out something else to compensate for it. You know, just seen it, you know, many times over the years. So, uh, it, it's, it's the blessing and the curse of improv, you know, since it's spontaneous, it's great. But but there's also the endless you know analysis of, of of what could have been you know and that's that's a balance I'm always trying to strike when I'm observing you know and offering hopefully helpful advice is how much is too much you know how much do you say yeah no that was great that was fine but you can tell the performer wasn't happy with it and how much do you say well here's where you you know this happened and and you see how that kind of stopped that and if you can talk it to that too so. Kind of like I'm doing now. No, so no, no, no. You're listen, to listen. Strike a balance. Uh, you know, and, and I think, I think, I think, you know, um, uh, it's everything you, you listen. Uh, uh, I don't know that I've ever gotten bad information from you. If I have, I wouldn't know it. Um, so, um, <laughs> but let's 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 get back. Let's for, uh, let's back up a little bit. Well, who were your influences who, when you uh, when you were watching movies and TVs as a kid growing up and stuff like that? Who influenced you? Um, well, as as a little kid, you, you know, because I'm of a certain age, uh, there, <laughs> there wasn't quite the, the media um, availability of, of whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted. Right, uh, back right, then. right. Uh, so, you know, I would watch TV, and, you know, we had one TV, and you watch what your parents watch. Right. And so, uh, it, growing up, uh, you know, on TV, I got a sense that, oh, okay, these people are funny, like the Smothers Brothers and, and right. you know, Flip Wilson. And then, you know, every singer, you know, uh, had the Sonny and Cher, had the variety show. But right. they'd have comedians on, Tim Conway, Harvey Corbin. Right. And then uh, they would also, you know, have old movies on TV. And that, that's where I discovered Laurel and Hardy and the Marx Brothers. And I was a, a big, big fan of... of you know, black and white films as a kid. I thought, that's pre- pretty interesting. My parents, we had an old, you know, standard eight movie camera, so my parents would buy me, you know, black and white movies uh, for, for my birthday. I, I just ate them up, Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd and Buster Keaton. And even as a kid, I would watch the movies and I kind of deconstruct them, try to figure out, you know, it wasn't just people running around and falling down and hitting each other. There, there was a lot of that, but there was a, a pattern to it there was a logic to it that uh, that I, as a kid I would try to kind of figure out and say okay how how do they set that up why why are they doing that you know how are they paying it up why is it satisfying and again not not thinking in quite such rational terms as an eight year old but 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 sensing that there's a, a pattern to, to these things and and then from then on whenever I watched anything uh, especially something funny you know stand up comedians or or whatever uh, I would try to figure out okay, how are they, how are they doing this? You know, uh, what's funny about this and how are they maximizing the humor in it? Uh, again, not always quite so analytical, you know, as, as I'm saying it now, but, uh, that, that's always been a, a fascination to me, uh, of what, what do people respond to, you know, uh, humor wise or just in general, why, why do they respond to it? How, how can you structure presenting it in such a way that it really it really comes across for them and it's satisfying for them and and for the performer um, as well. And there's a lot of elements of that in spontaneous creativity, and obviously there's a lot of elements of that in you know scripted scripted entertainment and produced entertainment as well. Uh, okay, see, and when, see what I, what wows me. Um, um, uh, okay. 
See, I didn't get that until later. What, yeah, were you watching shows and you were, um, how'd they do that? How was that funny? Why was that funny? Things like that. Now, um, because of some of the training is the workshops and stuff, like uh, you guys brought Dave Rosowski in and he gave me some ideas. And, and you know, I, I, as a kid, you know nothing about story arc. As a kid, you don't know anything about protagonists. Sure. You know, you're watching, did he fly right? Did he have superpowers? Did he save the girl? That kind of thing. And now, I sometimes I get mad because I, I go to a show and thinking, boy, they really missed it. <laughs> it was a bad script. It was horrible. They, you know, uh, you know, you talk, talk to us in class and stuff. You know, sometimes we, we miss the mark. We don't, we, you know, we miss the, you know, the offer. We, we, or we have too many offers. And I'm like, where'd they go? And, and so now they're, they, they're, I have to turn my brain off sometimes when I go see a movie because, and I can judge, which is bad. I'm judging things by their trailer now, by the cover of the book. Um, sure. Yeah, but well, but I didn't get that until the trailer's the best part. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that I've gone to a movie in a long time because I'm like, I really don't want to see this. I can wait for it to come out on pay per view. Um, but you, you, but see, this is the thing. Um, um, you know, I didn't get that until later, which is kind of okay. Um, uh, on the first incarnation of um, last in- comic standing, they had a, a, a Oriental fellow, and I can't remember his name. I was something tan, I think it was. Um, and he, his stand up routine, he actually had spreadsheets. And he sat down and figured out how many laughs did I get, and how many of this, and did this hit, and why did it hit. And he actually, I mean, he was very funny, you know, but. He had put a lot of energy in, into understanding sure. what worked, and I guess it's like anything else. There's a formula. You know, you got to find, you can find it, and that formula may be different for each performer and each audience and things like that. But and so you might find what your core audience is. Um, um, you know, and I, you know, I get, and I guess there are some people that are just innately funny. They're, they they get it. It's a natural thing. To, it's like throwing spaghetti against the wall. If it sticks, it's good. You know, um, mm-hmm. um, you got like Wayne Brady gets up there, and I don't know if he could do wrong. Now, here's the thing: I've seen some. You know, you go to enough sack shows, especially if you go to like the the later it gets in the evening. If you've gone to uh, enough. Um, Early shows, every once in a long while, they're tired, and, 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 and it's not as good as other shows are. And I don't mean knock that, but um, you can see the flaws sometimes. And mm-hmm. I'm the kind of person, that, for example, I, there was a period of time where I would go to the Hoop Did You Review every couple of months, and and I because I loved the performance. I loved the liveness of it. But also, it was different every time. How they reached that point, how they said those things. While they had the script and all, there were times where you could tell that the actor was off or you could tell that every once in a while they'd embellish something, and that's what I liked about it. Um, um, you, um, th- th- this, uh, I just, you know, I don't know where I'm going with this. You, you guys, I, I, think, I think that... Uh, um, um, well, I, it, you know, to, to speak to your point about kind of finding a formula... Uh, I know that that can be a, a tricky term for a lot of people. They, you know, they, uh, uh, studied improv a lot of a lot of different places, workshop with uh, a lot of different uh, theaters and philosophies, and, and you know, I, you know, pe- people will recoil against the idea of a, of a pattern or a formula. They, they you know, no, it, it's it's creative spontaneity. It's, it's you know, it's it's trust. It's it's throwing yourself in there. It's you know, breaking breaking boundaries. Uh, so, but so what I found that that a lot of times when, when we talk about a formula or a pattern, what it really is is, is kind of an inherent truth for a performer. It, it's something that is is so fundamental to them that that is is it's the thing that they always work off of, whatever that is. And, and I think that you know, good performers, uh, you know, effective performers. Uh, performers that people really enjoy watching and that enjoy doing it ha- have that, and I, I think it's just kind of figuring out what that is for yourself. It it can be similar to someone else's. It can be different, uh, and then you can put whatever label you you want on it. But it, as as long as you're kind of working from that inherent truthful base for yourself, uh, and for some people it, it could be a very surface shallow. <laughs> going for every gag base, but it's their inherent truth. <laughs> and so that's going to be their place of, of power and effectiveness. Uh, and, and, and I think a lot of uh, performance improv workshopping is just kind of figuring out what, what is, you know, what, what's sort of my, my sturdiest base that when, when everything's falling apart around me, which, you know, inevitably happens in, in uh, an improv show, uh, what what where do I kind of reset to? You know what's 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 my base that I return to, uh, and once I know that I can I can look to maybe expand on it or you know uh, develop it in certain ways. 
but I, I'm not casting around trying to figure out what to do because once I'm there, I always kind of know what to do. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, but but it's it's kind of a lifelong you know uh, process of, of the, you know because it changes I think a little as you get older too I mean if if you know for a while your 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 inherent truth is is always to go to something big and physical that you know that might change as you get older and your, <laughs> your body begins to to wear down in in different ways uh, so it you know it, it it's a process I don't think anyone ever says oh okay okay. Uh, I'm the guy that makes the uh, the sarcastic remark. Okay, good, got it. it you know, it's 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 not quite that that simple. Um, I think it, it's you know it's something you're probably not aware of. But if you kind of begin to to, to get aware of it, if you begin uh, no, noticing things, and again, there's no good or bad. It's just you know, I mean, r- r- the first class I ever took, uh, Aaron Schur, like I said, who was our, our teacher, very insightful. He had you know, he, I think he had a Either he had a degree in psychiatry or he <laughs> had a lot of training in it. And he could he could pretty much, and he didn't, he could pretty much pick things up and he would offer it and it wasn't in a, you know, a, a, a accusatory way. But he, you know, he would tell me, you stand at the power corner in every scene, you know, upstage right. You've generally got your arms crossed. You, you, you like kind of observing the scene. You know, you can immediately see the narrative and you kind of direct people. And he wasn't saying that's bad. He was just saying that this is something that comes out a lot. Right. Uh, and in order to be more well-rounded, you're going to want to move to the center of the stage. You're going to want to engage. You're going to want to shut up <laughs> um, and, and be affected. And, and, you know, logically you go, yes, I will do that. But it, it takes a while. You know, it takes a while because that, that when I started, was my, my inherent truth. That was my power base, which is, I don't want to get too pulled into this and get affected in front of all these strangers. Uh, I, I want to sort of stay apart from it, but I want to help direct it in a, in a way that I think will be good. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, and that way, if it goes wrong, I'm sort of on the outside. <laughs> I don't get blamed. And again, these are all very, very subconscious, you know, impulses. But when you have someone that, that's, you know, experienced and kind of watching dynamics over and over again, they can just point them out. Uh, and you can say that there are times when that will be helpful. There are times when getting engaged is going to be more helpful. Getting, getting affected is going to be more helpful. And, you know, and he was great because he pointed out if, if, you know, you have a strength of observing something and observing a situation and seeing the direction to which, which it could go and helping it go in, in, in a direction, uh, that might be something that you want to look into getting into writing, you know, and which which I did and and had uh, some success with. Uh, but because he had pointed out some of the things that you do on stage can be challenging, you know, to to creatively uh, spontaneously create on stage with other people, but they can be helpful for writing, you know. Um, and and so I think anything that you find you're good at on stage can apply to other areas as well. Very cool. Give me. Uh, I, I need to take a quick commercial break, and then uh, uh, I have some questions and things I want to talk about when we come back. And uh, all right, uh, give me one moment. You're listening to PJ and Friends on PJandFriends.com, Orlando, Florida. Have you ever wanted to ride in a hot air balloon? Well, you can with Orlando Balloon Rides. It's an adventure of a lifetime. Take a ride in a hot air balloon. You will fly with the winds on a truly amazing journey. Explore Florida from the orange groves to the theme parks and more. See it all from a whole new vantage point. Experience total excitement from start to finish. You will ascend above the treetops to several thousand feet. This is an experience of a lifetime. Visit OrlandoBloonRides.com for more information. That's OrlandoBloonRides.com. Zoom Air Adventure Park Orlando, zip lining at its best. A Zoom Air Adventure is a great alley for families, friends, or coworkers. This entertaining self-propelled attraction gives both nature lovers and challenge seekers the opportunity to enjoy the thrill of adventure. Thrill of adventure. Feel your adrenaline pump as you conquer abundant treetop challenges, including exhilarating rides on our zip line. Visit zoomair.us for more information. That's zoomair.us. Nalor Brazilian Steakhouse Winter Park. 
Nalor is an upscale casual Brazilian restaurant serving all-you-can-eat grilled meats, carved table side. Nalor serves more than 15 different cuts of beef, lamb, chicken, and pork using a traditional open flame churrasco barbecue. This provides the same tender and flavorful meats that have remained popular in Latin America for centuries. Nalor also boasts a gourmet salad bar with over 45 delectable choices ranging from smoked salmon to fresh asparagus, a variety of fine cheeses, prosciutto, mouth-watering hot dishes, and assorted seafood items. To complement the meal, every table is offered our house specialty, oven warm cheese bread. For reservations, call 407-645-1112. That's 407-645-1112. Or visit nolore.com. Excuse me, is that your Diet Pepsi? Sophia Vergara. Ah, uh, yeah, this, uh, <clears throat> this is my Diet Pepsi. I love Diet Pepsi. Do you love every sip? Uh, nothing is better than drinking a refreshing Diet Pepsi and just reveling in its crisp, delicious taste. Well, you know what they say. If you love something, let it go. And if it comes back, it was meant to be. So I should set this Diet Pepsi free and wait for it to come back. Then it'll be more delicious than ever. Would you hold my Diet Pepsi for me? I'd love to. Thank you. What happens now? Go, get out of here. It can't come back to you if you're standing next to it. Thanks, Sophia. I'll wait for you, Diet Pepsi. The only thing better than an ice cold Diet Pepsi is a free ice cold Diet Pepsi. Love every sip at dietpepsi.com. PJ and Friends has several ways to promote your product, service, club, group, or business. You can sponsor a segment or a whole show. Advertising packages are affordable. Uh, we can even barter and exchange for goods and services. Want to mow my lawn? That'll help me. Um, we can get you heard. We have live reads, 30 and 60 second commercials. We can do shows live on location. Uh, visit pjandfriends.com. Check our website out. Check out previous shows. Uh, friend us on Facebook. Uh, for more information on our sales, call 407-706-9497. 407-706-9497 or email me at sales at pjandfriends.com Alright, and now back to our buddy uh, John Hunter. Hey John, how Hello. are you? Hey, I'm, I'm back. So, you know, you, you should barter for some of those um, hot air balloon rides. That sounded pretty cool. I did have a, a bunch of those and I, I they're supposed to renew very soon. So um, they're 400 bucks yeah. a piece. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that I tell you what, you do an interview uh, on, on on in a hot air balloon. I'll, I'll get up at ten o'clock in the morning. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be ready for that. Let <laughs> me see what I can do because you know what the ones they sent us a while ago. They uh, um, I mean they sent me like a thousand dollars worth of them. Um, um, why don't they sent me three? So it was like fifteen hundred dollars. But um, they they they're like a champagne morning thing. You know, they they give you a bottle of champagne and 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 I don't know it's a bottle. I think a couple glasses. It'd be kind of bad to be drunk that high up in a balloon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um but uh, no, it's really kind of cool. Uh, I wouldn't go. Um, and I've, I've been a little leery of it because I'm thinking if someone falls out of that sucker, they're suing me, and I ain't got no money. Come on. <laughs> but but <laughs> let me see. Let me see. Out of a hot air balloon. Would you go? Would you think? Would Gina go? I don't know if my wife would go. Yeah, she has a fear of heights, but I've, I've I've never actually been up in a hot air balloon. I've always wanted to go up there. It seems like one of those experiences that would, uh, that, that you know, we should do. You should try at least once. Okay. I'll let you do it. I'll let me see what I can do. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, you know, I, just a quick uh, um, you know, anecdote, side note there. You, uh, it's funny that you mentioned psychology because I was listening to a, a thing on HBO with Mel Brooks, and he was telling me back in the day, apparently everybody in comedy went into therapy because it helped them with yeah. their comedy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, help them deal with their emotions. And, you know, uh, Richard Paul held, had a workshop at SAC, and it was dealing with, it was... Um, a uh, melodrama, and uh, uh, you know, is trying to deal with pe to teach people how to deal with their emotions and and identify them because oftentimes when people say they're happy, they come out angry. You know, sure. they 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 they, they they're not sure what their emotions are, and so, and I could tell some people really regretted coming to that workshop because they weren't ready to deal with what they were doing, and it wasn't meant to be anything other than an and a uh, you know here this is what we're trying to get you to to feel or, or present that you're feeling. Um, it's kind of like people can't they shouldn't be communicating when they text or the email because people will read the text or email based on how they're feeling, not how it was written. Um, yeah. But anyway, it's it's ironic that you said that because I, I I was thinking that that that's so important. I think I think it's, uh, and the fact that um, what was that gentleman's name uh, the, the, the the your your first coach at SAC. 
Um, oh, Aaron. Yeah, yeah, Aaron's yeah, the fact that he was that insightful, I don't know about him, but that that's a, that was probably a very useful thing. I mean, a very, very... Uh, to, to, uh, was SAC charging money for workshops back then? Yeah, I mean, it was the first... Well, the, the, the Monday night workshop that, that kind of different members of the cast, including Wayne, would run, uh, were uh, just $5. He would come and drop in and... And it, it, again, it was just a wide, wide uh, variety of people that would just come in and hop up on stage, and and they would kind of <laughs> talk us through some some basic scene work. Uh, but then when they formalized it into an eight week class, yeah, the first the first class was uh, sixty dollars for eight weeks. Don't tell and, don't, uh, don't tell people that. Don't tell it's, <laughs> don't tell people that. <laughs> this is over twenty years ago. Though, oh so, yeah. oh <laughs> sure sure. <laughs> um, Inflation kicks in, uh, but. But people, and again, sort of to your point about, you know, how people bring emotion or interpret emotion. I mean, I found that, you know, over 20 years of, of exploring improv, a lot of it is just therapy for people. <laughs> it really is. I, I, I don't know what the percentage is of people that, you know, uh, take, take formal improv training or explore improv, what the percentage is of people that actually perform it uh, for some kind of living. I, I don't, you know. I don't imagine it's huge. I imagine there's many more people exploring it than are actually kind of performing it in a in a professional, uh, you know, uh, uh, for professional reasons. But but I think everyone is getting something you know, psychologically, emotionally from it. Uh, you know, it, it allows you to explore some some areas of your life that you know you you want to explore or work on. So um, it, it, it's interesting because people will come in and take a class. You know, thinking of this, I'm going to be the next John Belushi, um, which is a little sad now when I mention him. A lot of a lot of my students give me a blank look, uh, <laughs> and then they, they they stick around because they realize, well, I, I really feel good after I do this, and and vice versa. People come in and say, I, I just, you know, I, I've kind of I've got some some personal things that I I think that would be helped by you know uh, interacting with a group, and and then they say, hey, you know what, I want to do this for a living. So, uh, it, it's it's you know, I think it, it, it feeds something in, in people. I mean, it, it has to. Otherwise, you, you wouldn't keep doing it because it's certainly, certainly not like you're going to get rich doing it. It's funny that you mentioned that. Don't uh, you should talk to uh, 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 Chris Dinger and see if he can get insurance coverage for people that come into workshops. Think about yeah, it. A whole new revenue it, stream for SAC Comedy Lab. If, if it were covered by insurance for therapy, uh, well, you probably would take forever to get paid. Though. It's, it's got to be like Groupon. You never get paid. Uh, it's like uh, well, when, yeah, I remember when I was in Los Angeles, they did they did have improv therapy that was covered <laughs> by some insurance companies. And I said, "Wow, that's that's fantastic! How do how do I get in on that?" <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, so let's talk about um, um, so so uh, how long have you been married to Gina? Um, my my current my current wife, uh, my my second wife. You make my you make life. it sound um, so disposable. <laughs> and I, I'm not yeah, saying that. I, I'm not trying to get you in trouble, that. but Correct. you make that sound yeah. so disposable. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I want to keep my options open. Oh. Now. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I I actually met uh, Gina back in the '90s when I was performing performing at SAC. I was uh, married to uh, another woman at the time, so um, we, you know, Gina and I were were friends. Uh, she was one of the performers that was sort of uh, coming up as I left for L.A. Uh, and then when I came back in 2004, uh, she was still here, still performing, uh, hosting. Uh, and um, uh, I was single, and she was single. So uh, we started talking, and uh, not not long after I got back, we started going out. And and then we said, uh, well, hey, why don't, why don't we get married? Um <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 no, no, wait, wait, really, you know, hey, I got nothing better to do on Thursday, how about you, no, let's go get married, that's great. <laughs> well, it was one of those yes and situations, oh. <laughs> just, oh. uh, yeah, we just kept escalating the offer, we found the game, and, uh, you know, <laughs> next thing we know, we were at the offer going, wow, this, this got out of hand quick, you know, <laughs> so, uh, so no, she, she's amazing. She's wonderful. Um, uh, she, you know, it, it is funny what improv will do because I, I would not have met her had it not, not been for improv. Um, it brings you in contact with people that I think, um, you know, uh, can really, you know, you, you're attracted to people that can, I don't want to say fill a void in your life because that makes them sound, you know, so it's kind of a mechanical term, but you sense that you need something and you sense that someone else has that. And maybe you have something they need as well, 
um, you know, and, and not every improv relationship is romantic. Uh, but, you know, in, in this case it was. So uh, it, it worked out uh, really well. So, again, just, just another reason for me to be very, very grateful. Well, you know, uh, anybody that knows Gina, she's, she's a wonderful lady, and, and she's just a sweet sweetheart. And I miss seeing her perform. But uh, and I do that. Uh, you know, here's the thing. Uh, while SAC is doing wonderful, and I know they're doing a lot better than they were a couple of years ago, which is good. Um, it, it, you know, I'm I'm 48 years old. I I'm a, I, and I never thought I'd be like this. You know, my dad when he you know would sit down and watch like Andy Griffith, and I wouldn't understand what what I, I, I why, you know. And and they'd watch reruns of Mash and all these old shows and Archie Bunker, and I'm like, but there's new shows on now. I get it. You know, sure. um, and, yeah. and 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 I, but see, then I look at I, I miss Dave Russell on stage. I don't get to see you much. You do, you do perform, but not as much as you used to. Um, yeah. You're there during the day. I mean, if you don't have to be there at night, why would you? Um, yeah. Well, I, I got dragged in last night. In fact, so yeah, <laughs> someone someone uh, forgot they were in the show. I, I was in the kitchen at the theater working on the ice machine at seven thirty. I came in and said, "Hey, can we, can you jump in the show? We're down one." Uh, so I, I went out, you know, I had, had grease on my jeans and, uh, you know, sweat stains, uh, went, but went out and, uh, and did a show. Um, and that's, that's the great thing about it is, you know, some of the performers and now I haven't, you know, performed with very much, but I, I know them, I like them, I trust them. Uh, so I was able to go out there and just, just have a great time. Uh, you know, and that, that's such a testament to, you know, where we're at now and, and, and the job that the, the current cast is doing and our artistic director just kind of having a group of people that, you know, say, hey, I haven't really played with you that much, but um, you know what? It's not going to be a problem. And, and it wasn't. It was, it was a lot of fun. I was glad to be able to jump in um, <laughs> literally at a moment's notice. So um, let me, I have a couple of questions I usually ask people. Um, there are right answers, so um, um, it's important. Uh, uh, so, so first, first a little, uh, what, uh, 13-year-old you, what would you have been listening to music-wise? Name three bands you would have been listening to. Mm, 13. Um, probably, gosh, what, what, what was 13? That was so long ago. Uh, that would have been hmm, late, late 70s. Um, Hey, good question. I, it wasn't until high school that I really got into the, the Eagles and Cheap Trick, okay. ACDC. See, um, see I, I, I knew I liked you for a reason. That's good music. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, back back then, it was, you know, it was it was rock and roll. It was you know, um, you know, pop, pop and rock and roll. Uh, the, the, you know, and again, this is this is long, long ago before everyone had a personal personal device where you could listen to whatever music whenever you wanted. It was pretty much the radio. And if someone, you know, had one of those, uh, uh, you know, cassette players, you know, the, the size of a, of a small book that clips to your, right. <laughs> you your, your belt loop and then some headphones, uh, you could listen to a cassette. Um, and you could rewind and listen to the song again. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, mu the musical tastes were, were pretty much going to be your top 40. Um, unless you had some cool friends, which, which I did, uh, that would, would, you know, say, Hey, listen, this, that, this is from a band called Kraftwerk. <laughs> wow. It was techno music. It was, it was, uh, something, something new and different, but yeah, it was, it was pretty much right down the middle of the road. What are you listening to now? What's on, what, what kind of music do you listen to now? Oh gosh, it, it's all over the place, but it is a lot of, uh, my iPod is just a lot of seventies and eighties music. I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. I'm with you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll hear stuff, uh, you know, our, our, our technical director is, is at the theater is really good about kind of updating the, the playlist of the theater uh, songs, and, and I'll hear songs, and, oh, that's good, and, I, and I'll ask him, who is that, and he'll tell me, and I'll kind of make a mental note, like, oh, I should, you know, download that, and then I completely forget, you know, <laughs> what, what, what was that artist's name again, what was the name of that song? Uh, so it's not that, you know, I don't, I don't like, you know, stuff that's coming out currently, uh, it's just that, you know, I think I'm at that age where I've only got so many memory memory chips in my brain. <laughs> and, and for music, all of it is just loaded up on 70s and 80s and some 90s music. Um, all right, so, so the next question is, uh, if you go out to eat and you order a steak, is it mm -hmm. uh, rare, medium rare, uh, well done, or burnt? Medium rare. Very Medium good. rare, right, again, right down the middle. And if you <laughs> if you had a potato with that, is it baked potato, mashed potato, or fries? Whew, I, I like fries. I like the fries, especially if they're steak fries, the big ones. Oh the yeah, big steak yeah. Fries, yeah. 
All right. Um, yeah. uh, this next one is a geek check. Okay, uh, so how big of a geek you are? Um, uh, when 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 uh, watching any kind of a superhero movie or any kind of a comic or a cartoon, is it Marvel or DC? Oh, uh, I was a DC guy growing up. I mean, uh, it was you know, it, it it was just yeah, it was just Marvel and DC. And I had Marvel friends, you know, and 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 so I kind of got a little bit of the best of both worlds because I would just read 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 their comic books and then I would buy DC. Uh, but you know, f- from way early on, I mean, he, Batman got a hold of me early. Um, cause I, <laughs> he got a hold of Robin I, too. I, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, it was. It wasn't a case where I'm not old enough to have seen the the Batman TV show in the first run, but I, I pretty much caught it the second the second time when it first went into reruns, and uh, I thought, well, that that guy's got it figured out. Um, and then the, you know, I saw the the comic book. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it wasn't like a conscious choice of, oh, DC over Marvel, but I just kind of gravitated that way. Uh, and again, this is, this is a, a, a kind of a time when, you know, c- comics were cool until you're about 10 and then you stop talking about them, uh, or admitting that you read them. Cause you know, people would kind of look at you funny and say, come on, grow up, you know, we're 12 years old now. And it's just interesting with the, uh, the advent of the internet, how, you know, geekdom, as it's called, <laughs> it was just uh, burst into the, the mainstream, you know, where not only is it okay to talk about, you know, reading comics and liking comics and analyzing comics, but it's celebrated, you know. And uh, I think it's great. It's fantastic. I'm, I'm a little envious. I'm like, wow, I kind of wish <laughs> all this stuff had been around when I was growing up. Yeah. But but it, it's great to see that, that it, it's no longer marginalized or, or kind of uh, looked at in a certain light the way it used to be. Uh, there's a follow-up question to the Geek Check. Uh, uh, when watching Star Trek, is it the original series or Next Generation? It's always the original series. See? I mean, you know. there, the, the, yeah. I'm going to tell you why this is the right answer. I'm going to tell you why this is the right answer. Uh, when Mike Carr was on our show way back when, and he did a, 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 a contest between Matt, a, a tri- trivia contest, um, uh, he is original series. Uh, the other day when I talked to uh, uh, Dave Russell, he is original series. So my theory is, if you want to be a leader at SAC, it has to be the original series. <laughs> right? So uh, it, it, it could be. It could be just we're all old guys. We'll step for Mike. Oh, sure. It's a way to yes <laughs> and, Mr. Hunter. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, I mean, I love the other stuff, you know, uh, you know, Next Generation, Voyager, um, all the ancillary, you know, I think that J.J. Abrams' reboot was, was masterfully done. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, again, growing up when, you know, there were three, maybe four channels, and Star Trek came on at 5 o'clock on Channel 44, and you said, okay, great, and, you know, you watched it and it had commercials, but you thought, this is fantastic. And again, uh, went, went to a, a convention Oh my gosh, 1976, uh, and it was a kind of a sci-fi comic book convention, and uh, they they ran one of the Star Trek episodes. They had one of the extras from the episodes of the speaker, you know. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm 10, 12 years old, and I'm thinking, wow, there's a lot of adults here. That was my first inkling that maybe you could grow up and still like stuff like this. Um, but you know, you had no idea that it was it was going to blow up so big. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'm sure the actors involved didn't either. I'm sure they're glad it did. But yeah, the, the original series just, you know, it, it kind of has that that uh, uh, what's the word? The, the innocence to it. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Well, we're, we're doing a fun TV show, and and uh, it's cool. We really like it. And, and now we'll move on to the next gig. Um, but uh, you know, it t- turned out to be much more than that. Okay, I have uh, I have another question for you, and. Um uh, the answers to this are always telling. So, um, uh, if you were trapped on a, on a deserted island, um, would what one item and one person would you bring with you? Uh, um, well, I'd probably you should bring my wife. I would <laughs> probably the, the best move, um, and certainly the, the one I would make. One item, um, I, I guess it would be an airplane, <laughs> or a hot air balloon. <laughs> I wouldn't be trapped on the island anymore. <laughs> okay, see, see, here's the thing. All right, see, here's the thing. I usually get the answer, the most common answer is some sort of a significant other, which I don't understand why you'd want to doom them to that island, but okay. Uh, however, uh, Dave Russell turned it into a romantic getaway. Uh, he brought uh, his wife, and uh, I can't remember what it was. There was something else that was made it romantic. I think a bottle of wine or something. Um, and then, uh, uh, but everybody else, it was 
I want to bring so and so, and then they want a machete or they wanted a a you know fire or they plan on one person decided they wanted to bring a satellite phone, and then they, sure. then they but however you brought a plane. So, uh, clearly, you could take her with you. So, while it's not dooming them, um, you know, it's still interesting that most people bring their, their significant other. Um, for, uh, you know, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, this has been awesome. You, um, um, you know, I... Well, thanks for having me. You know, um, I don't think people realize, uh, you know, when... The, the changes happened when uh, the changes happened at Santa Comedy Lab. My car had to make some hard decisions. It was probably rough and all that. And 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 um, you know he he uh, it couldn't have been easy. When you do your t- teach the classes and you have to make decisions of who comes and goes as far as lab rats and so forth. And when you do your schedule and people are disappointed because they're not getting so many, whatever it can't you know it's not like you probably don't want to give people all the spots that they could get. But there's only so many in a, in a month. And 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 there are, you know people that may need to learn a few more things before they're ready to do certain things. And I I get that. And that can't be easy because um, I'm sure you've been on the other side of that. Now, it doesn't make it easier for, for us to hear no, but, you know, uh, uh, I appreciate everything you're doing. And um, okay, well, thank you. clearly, SAC is doing uh, something right because they, they, they are better off than they've been in a long, long while, and it just seems to be getting better. So uh, bravo to all of you guys for doing what you do. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for being part of it. We uh, really, really, really enjoy talking with you, and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, all, it's always very flattering <laughs> to be asked to, to you know, speak, speaking of hot air balloons, to spew some hot air. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, uh, thanks, thanks for having me on, and uh, thanks for being part of the theater. You, you, uh, hey, uh, I, it's my honor, and I, I can't uh, I can't be thankful enough for what, everything you guys let me do. Um, um, you know, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you for your time, and uh, I'll let you go. And uh, uh, if there's ever anything you guys need to promote or anything you need to do, let me know, and we'll do our best to help you out. Well, thanks so much, PJ. I appreciate it, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure we'll talk soon. All right, bye bye. Uh, take care. Bye bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this has been another edition of PJ and Friends uh, Spotlight Interview Series with Mr. John Hunter. Uh, I want to say from SAC Comedy Lab. Well, also, he's associated with it, but he isn't from there. But he's a very integral part of what goes on there. He is vice president of SAC Comedy Lab. So, theory dictates if he wants to move up, we need to knock the president off. And I'm not saying we should. I'm, you know, I like Dave, but you know... Um, it's kind of like kind of like Queen Elizabeth. This woman just won't die, right? Right? Poor people that are next in line aren't going to get it. So, if, you know. Um, anyway, uh, there we are. Uh, I, I think John Hunter's awesome. I think his wife is even awesome. Uh, she's a wonderful lady. If you've not met her, you want to meet her. She's a great lady. She runs a lot of things there at SAC. Um, I want to thank you guys for your time. Take a minute to stop by pjandfriends.com. Uh, like us on Facebook. We want to be liked because we need to be liked. We need that emotional thing. Or I'm going to wind up in therapy at SAC and no insurance. Um, You guys have a great day, and uh, I'll talk to you later. You're listening to PJ and Friends on PJandFriends.com.